and welcome to Petra Coaches, Coaches Corner. And so today with me is Jennifer Falk from here in Nashville. Hi, Jennifer. And David Pierce in Louisville, Kentucky. So at Petra Coach, uh, we certainly work with businesses to help them with their strategic planning and then the execution of those plans in a way that allows them to get the true meaning or the purpose behind why they do what they do in business. And what we do at Petra Coach is we also provide resources back to those we serve in a way that allows you to be informed of the things you could or should go do to move your business forward. So, uh, Jennifer, if you'd like to turn it to you, a few things you'd like to say to kick us off today, and then we'll start to dive into questions from our attendees. So share a few a few things with us, Jennifer. Yeah. Hey, hey, everybody. Glad you're joining us as you're coming in. Uh, get your questions ready so we can maximize our time together, use this as an opportunity to learn, to get better. And today is about, um, this is Coach's Corner. You can ask us anything you want. And we are, uh, we're excited to get to get to help you out there. David, anything from you? Yeah, just uh, we're, we're excited to be here today. We've heard a lot of things from our members over the years. So hopefully you won't throw us any, any hard balls we don't know the answer to. But if not, we've got, uh, we've got resources. So bring your questions in and we're looking forward to discussing them with you. Looks like we still have some coming online. I uh, do see Dwayne Honoré from in uh, De Honoré Construction in Louisiana. Let's see if we have a few others that pop on here. Or Dwayne, you can start firing away. You've got three on one uh, ability to get anything you want answered. You know, one thing that uh, came up yesterday, we did a large workshop for a, a private um, association, organization of entrepreneurs. And we've been doing these pivot planning workshops also publicly, but we're doing a lot of them pri for private associations. And what we've done is we've added a more strategic planning exercise called the SWET, similar to SWAT, um, you know, strengths, weaknesses, and trends. And so those trends, and I'm teeing this up for you guys, and I'm going to ask you to help, you know, help us talk about what those trends look like. But these trends force you to look beyond your industry and start tracking trends from around, uh, around you with that one question in mind. Can that trend be a game changer in our industry? If you're looking at technology, distribution, product innovation, markets, customers, social trends, anything like that, what are you, uh, Marshall and David, seeing as trends that are emerging out of this? David, you want to go first? Yeah, a couple of things. I don't think these are trends. Friends or pain. Uh, I'm in Kentucky, so we've got all the bourbon distilleries, obviously, around. <clears throat> Basically, they have all switched to uh, creating hand sanitizer, running uh, uh, instead of distilling alcoholic beverages, they're distilling sanitizer and uh, finding it obviously to be in demand. But they're now they're they're realizing that they're with their capabilities, they can pivot to different product lines when they were strictly, often these plants would set idle because they weren't producing uh, the, the bourbon or whatever the, the brand that they were doing. So now they found ways to utilize that downtime uh, that could be a profit, profit um, stream for them as well. So that's more of a pivot than a trend, but it's a trend because it will continue, I think, to benefit these industries that uh, often have a lot of excess capacity that you know they, they don't know what to do with. So. I thought that was a pretty good, pretty good trend that's going on here in Kentucky, especially. Jennifer, I, I think the biggest trend that I'm seeing, and it was one that was may not have ever gotten us to where that we are at, had it not been for the crisis that we've just gone through, and that is the act of virtual selling. So it is a, some trends we might say, well, maybe that's a trend. I've seen this a little bit, or maybe I haven't seen it, but the act of virtual selling is going to be the art that those who can master, well, let's just go beyond, let's go beyond virtual selling, virtually running our business. Those who that can master the art of virtual businesses and then complement it with the face-to-face -face interaction versus the foundation being face-to-face -face interaction complemented with virtual are gonna be those businesses that will thrive for quite some time. 
and, and the foundation that we have to build that upon is obviously we overuse it, but the Amazon easy button. So Amazon basically makes things easy. So we have to go from face to face to virtual. And we know that we've done that as well, but we also have to make it easier than ever and then use those. I, I almost look now and being a people person, I look now as face to face as a privilege. Like, I don't know, I'm going to be so excited when I start getting to interact back in person again, I'm going to cherish those interactions in a way different than ever before. Cause I couldn't take them for granted anymore. One cool thing about <clears throat> having bringing some virtual and face to face together, uh, saw Mark Cuban. Uh, he said, "You know, there's something about having a drink when you're signing a deal. It's hard to do that virtually, obviously. So what he does, what he said, he says, I send my client or my customer a bottle of whatever I'm going to serve, exactly what I have. So I say, don't do anything with this till we have our our closing." And they both get out the same bottle of wine or the same bottle of bourbon or whatever and pour the same drink and they enjoy a virtual drink. And it really builds that connection that you have when you're kind of settling things up and, and celebrating. You're, you're actually enjoying the same, the same thing together. You said that was a really a cool, cool thing to kind of bring them both worlds together. I, I like that. I love that. You know, and digital's not going away, right? If anything, this has sped up the need for organizations to be able to work virtually and do business virtually um, using digital platforms. Um, and as, as people are joining us, please uh, type questions in the chat box. We are ready to answer those. We're getting started just talking about what trends we're seeing in, in industries right now that maybe you can go capitalize on. So uh, please use this time to, uh, to get some questions through that you can, you can ask. Jennifer, I want to, in trends, you know, we all often think of, you know, trends and capitalizing on trends. And David just remind me of uh, the trends of, I'll put it in the category of creating powerful moments, David, that rolls under what you just said. Uh, and they're not always associated with celebration. They could be celebrated with connection. And I know today, and it caught me off guard, I was working with one of our current members and I made the following comment. I said, I know where I was driving down the road on March 13th when you told me you were scared of your workforce being inside of people's homes and that you wanted to go ahead and remove them from going out into the field and into people's homes. And I was not prepared for what I would witness. And that is the fact that this person teared up and it just really is the fact that we created that connection during that time which was creating the power of moments that we log in our memory that become catalysts or pivots in who we become or what we eventually do with the situation we're in. And I think uh, that category of trends or creating powerful moments is one that we need to keep in the back of our mind as well. Yeah, and we've never had more time to create those moments than we do now. Normally we're so busy moving on to the next thing that we don't spend the time to really create those moments. And it takes some time. It takes a little effort and thought to create those things. No better time now when we're all sitting at home to spend a little time working on what are those moments. And you can do a lot from home to create those moments with, you know, outside services, delivering product or whatever it is. But no better time now than, than to improve on your act. And it's not an act. It's a relationship build. And we've now got that time. So don't waste your time. Uh, not becoming better through this process. David, I want to lead with a question now, and then I'll turn it back to you and Jennifer as well. And this is something, I want to pull those hot topics that I'm sure are on people's minds. So we've gone through this, uh, you know, whether it's safer at home, stay at home, shelter in place, all those things. I get confused about exactly what all of them exactly mean, besides the fact that I just stay home all the time anyway. But now we're moving towards, you know, the fog is lifting, the the, the world is opening somewhat. David, I'd like to get yours and Jennifer's experiences because I'm coming across people that think that, hey, you know, Monday we're going to open up the office and we're going to all go back to work. And we start talking about, well, what are your policies if someone gets sick? And are you getting PPE? And are you going to do testing protocols? And are you going to realign your workstations? And then all of a sudden I get hit with this look like, oh no. Can you share some of your experiences, David, and then Jennifer in regards to companies you work with, and what are they doing to prepare for this next normal on the way to the new normal? Yeah, I think, I, I think they learned a lot by having to react immediately to this crisis. I mean, it hit us. It was, it was a sucker punch. So it took them a couple of weeks, but they learned a lot in doing that. 
uh, either through you know moving the workforce out or having the offices cleaned or whatever. So they've learned a lot to, to apply going forward. Uh, the problem, I think more so the problem that I'm seeing, and this isn't a solution, is behaviors. Uh, and I think it's going to be a long time before our behaviors, if they ever do, return to the old behaviors. Meaning, you know, half your team does, may not mind coming into work. The other half's going to be a little skittish and they may not want to come in. So are they going to, is it going to cause a problem if they raise their hand and say, I, you know, Marshall, I really don't want to be in that office yet. And I'm just not sure, but what kind of, what kind of politics are going to be involved in this process? Is there going to be pressure to come in and, and do things? So I think behavior is the biggest, I think going to be the bigger problem, changing behaviors or adapting behaviors to the, to this new world we live in versus building a, a safe place to work. And I'm seeing, that's the question I'm getting is, God, you know, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can, mask and suits and whatever. <clears throat> but there's still a lot of people because they don't want to infect their families and their kids. They're not going to do it until they're just absolutely sure. So how do we deal with that uh, is a question I'm getting, Marshall, a lot from our members. Jennifer, before I go to you, I want to hit David while he's on a roll here that extends this question, and that is the following. David, how do we navigate through when, whether or not they want to come back or not, data shows that some people, either by age or health conditions or both, or comorbidities, that some people are more at risk than others. How do we set up a safe place that's open to all without violating HR policies, principles, and things you can or do or say? You know, I, I think through this time, one good thing is I think we've been able to bridge some topics that have somewhat been taboo because it's, it was more on really thinking about the person, their health and safety. So I think we've got to have those conversations, Marshall, with people that may be more at risk. We've got to accommodate them. I and mean, it is on us as leaders to protect our people. And if that means if you're in an age group that is more susceptible or you have some health conditions, then obviously ask them what they're comfortable with, first of all. But I think we're going to have to make some accommodations and everybody else on the team is going to have to accept that. And I think that's we're it's a new world and um, we're going to have to just build, build, you know, two or three different scenarios where people can work for us uh, to accommodate that. And I think that's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. We, we are people first. As a leader, we've got to protect our people. And nobody should have a problem with that on your team if somebody gets to work at home because of this and the other person doesn't. So that's part of your culture as well. It's obviously which we spend a lot of time helping companies and members work on their culture. All right, Jennifer, knock us out with it. Yeah, you know, I think it's all about transparency and having a plan, right? And then communicating that plan. So, you know, making sure people feel safe coming back into the office environment, communicating to them what you've done to um, disinfect, to clean, to shift around the office environment to make sure that they're six feet apart. What are the rules that you're going to um, use within the organization about washing your hands before you enter the space and, and what you're allowed to bring into the space? Are you able to eat at your desk or within the area? Are we able to get takeout food delivered? I mean, really small things like that can make certain people feel a little uncomfortable. And I think this is a phased approach, right? So we have phases that we are starting to bring people back into our face-to-face -face work environment where we do a soft opening, so to speak, and say, you know, what we're doing for now is maybe we have uh, only half of the people come in from each team and they alternate days. Uh, and then allowing the people who don't feel comfortable coming in, especially if they themselves or a family member have autoimmune dis um, you know, situation they are living with, um, they, they should not feel like they can't come into work um, or they, they have, are forced to come into work and, and trade that off for the health of themselves or their family. And, and, you know, like you said, it's a culture thing, David, going back to culture. Um, you know, we're all in this together is kind of the, the word, but is the phrase, but how are we actually showing our teams that we are truly all in this together? Marsha, one, one quick thing that I'm seeing, we coach a couple of, of um, private aircraft management companies and they obviously have two pilots or three pilots or whatever at the crews. And often the crews, you know, just switch around that you don't always fly with the same person, but they, they've adopted a policy where they keep They're keeping their crews intact. So if one crew comes down with something, it doesn't wipe out 
everybody else. <clears throat> and, uh, and that apply, I think that could apply to a lot of businesses. Maybe you start, maybe you create some, some, some crews that they're always together. If you send out a crew to service some, it's the same crew. So you don't cross contaminate if that's the, if that's the right word. So you can maintain your business. We had a big manufacturing company. They kind of created, they were thinking about it. They actually followed through because it just didn't, didn't make total sense uh, the way they were going to attempt to do it. But they were going to create different crews for lines of production. And one crew was going to be put up in a hotel and they were going to agree to do that for a couple of weeks. And I don't know if you need to go those kind of extremes, but they were protecting their ability to continue to be in operation by having select teams that stayed together, just like an army, just like a platoon or something, you know? So I think we may want to rethink how we, how we design the way we do our business by using this team approach. Yeah. I think also too, what really gets perplexing is, 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 we can be in control of our own desires and our own destiny. Imagine people who share buildings with five other tenants and the other four are reckless in their behavior. And so then it becomes, it just becomes complex, right? But I think we could all agree that the general tendency is be slower back to moving everyone into the workplace than you probably think you should or could or want to be. And, and I've laughed with some of the older leaders. I say that in the context that, with the exception of Jennifer, David, you and I are old, but I've shared with some of the older leaders that older people never believe that the world could transfer to virtual and now they've learned their lessons. So why not let's leverage it? And by the way, in the last few days, two different leaders have recognized one said it last night in our Petro Forum group, one said it today. I need to stop going to the office so much because I'm not adding value in the office. I'm more productive at home and I get caught up in the stimulus or the energy, positive or negative, at the office. So I want to start with Jennifer. I want to ask another question, Jennifer, and then I'll go to you, David, because this will be near and dear to your heart. Going into this, most businesses did not conserve cash like they should have. Restaurants, 17 days insert whatever we get in a planning day we bring up the cash section everyone's eyes gloss over no one wants to talk about cash now they want to talk about cash first i think in my brain what is that if we say normally businesses should take on or have three months cash how does that get modified by either i have a highly recurring revenue model so maybe it's not three months or i have a very transactional model and now it's six months so Jennifer, I'd like to start with you and say, what is your mindset on cash and your guidance that you give to businesses in regards to how they best position themselves with cash? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've heard David say this a million times, right? And, and we've all heard the phrase recently, if you're familiar with Petra, the cash is king. So we are preaching liquidity right now. Everything that you can possibly do to hang on to your cash, you need to hang on to that cash. Access to PPP, do you have access to a line of credit? And then absolutely, you know, looking, you know, six months out, worst case scenario, what am I going to need from a cash standpoint to keep my business's doors open? David has a really cool tool that helps project what that cash flow looks like on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, we, we love our resident uh, former banker, CPA accountant on the team because he uh, gives us a lot of, um, a lot of good good pointers on that. I'm going to throw it over to you, David. I think you can add a lot of value. Yeah, I, I think the first thing I was going to say, and you just said it is <clears throat> you used to maybe look at cash on a monthly or a weekly basis based on your budgets and history. You now need to wake up every morning and look at cash. It needs to be a daily focus and it may remain that way for quite some time. So I'm recommending, we're recommending and we're seeing our members and a lot of uh, other, other companies that we speak with are, actually sitting down and doing a very manual process of projecting cash over the next 30, 60, 90 days based on real expectations of when they're going to get their money, knowing that they're going to get paid a little later. So they're building in 15 days or whatever extra time needs to be. And they're being realistic about when they think they can pay their expenses and I actually sit down every day and they're scheduling out 90 days, based on the current status of everything and what they think that looks like. And that's very telling because you'll find, if I looked at it out a month, I typically am maybe okay. 
enough cash comes in in a month, must, enough goes, and it goes out just to kind of match them. Okay. But if you start matching up days, you'll find weeks where you're in the hole until that money comes in. So those are the holes you got to begin to fill. So you've got to, got to get a good realistic picture of what you look like on 30, 60, 90, and longer if you can, down to the day if possible. And then you, you identify the holes, and I'd say then double it. <laughs> you know, whatever the holes are, double it or triple it, and then go find sources of liquidity. Use the PPP funds in the short run. There's a Main Street lending thing coming out now that the Federal Reserve is going to uh, use through the banking system, which we've got some, some webinars. Love to have you join us on one of those in the future. Um, but the point is, even if you never were big into borrowing, you need to consider it now because this thing may go on much longer than we anticipate. <clears throat> and the worst time to look for money is when you need money. And being an old banker, I'm more apt to loan to you when you're in good shape than I am when you're in bad shape. It's just the nature of the beast. So now's the time to be focused on all sources of cash and liquidity that you can get your hands on. Um, this Main Street lending might be the next big thing out there that allows us to build some liquidity in our balance sheets. So David, I'm gonna share some of you and Jennifer, you've never heard me say this before, and you know how I uh, operate in this world of how to, how to survive being country dumb, but I'm gonna share in regards to something you can do at home that gets your brain in the right mode thinking of the business. I know about how long my air conditioner unit is going to last on my house. I know how long my roof is going to last on my house. I know about how many miles I get out of tires on my cars. I know when tuitions due. I know when my federal quarterly tax payments are due. And I take a list of a piece of paper and I schedule those out so that I, even down to like a mattress when I'm going to need a new mattress, all those things that cost several thousand dollars, I don't want to be surprised. If you want to get to the worst side of me, surprise me with something. Yeah. And I encourage everyone to adopt those same kind of things as they run their household so that you're never surprised and really fund some of those things that are, you know, an air conditioner expense these days is, you know, it's probably somewhere between seven and $20,000 to replace your AC units. Should we wait when we know, when we look at it, when we're cutting the grass and know it's 15 years old to wait till it falls apart and then scream, I don't have any money. No, you wouldn't do that. So use those simple things at home to apply to your mindset and your business as well. And then you can remove the surprise. Yeah, so some other ways to improve liquidity. I mean, we're kind of in survival mode. Some of us are, or we will be for a while. Uh, maybe it's time to, to get rid of those marginal business lines you've got. Maybe it's time to get rid of those excess assets you don't really use, but you're always saving, thinking you might at some point in time and raise some cash. You know, maybe you shut down a line of business, which is very marginal, but you always had hope for it. Maybe you focus on your strengths now and, and, and not so much on those weaknesses, if, you, if, it, if it means improving your cash flow. I really, the ones with cash that survive this thing will have huge opportunities, but you got to get to the other side. And if it's in cash is going to get you there uh, more so than hopeful, hopeful thinking will be. You know, David, you talk about get rid of some of those marginal business lines. So I think all business leaders, many business leaders fall in the trap of feeling like they need to be everything to everyone. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example, a real life example and experience. I'll leave out company names. Uh, at one point in time, I worked for a very large provider of transportation services in the United States, really large. And we would run in and out of cities all over the place to get a load of freight. If you go to Fargo, North Dakota, one way or another, you may be a fully loaded truck one way and you may be dead empty coming the other way. So you divide everything you made by two. However, another, actually it was a family member, but a very, a, a separate transportation provider stayed within a hundred miles of I-40, north and, north and south of I-40, i.e. the power lane. We were three times the size of the other company and about 20% of the profits. And the point being is we're running around knowing the things we should eliminate the waste. There's eliminate the waste that's not producing. There's also take advantage of the waste in the liquor distillery, turn hand sanitizer that's taking advantage of waste. But you got to be willing to not attempt to be everything to everyone, determine what you want to be good at 
And part of my language is be really damn good about your day job or what you want to be good at. And then get rid of all the other noise that's just attempting to be the everything to everybody. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think the word we keep hearing is simplification. You know, get rid of the complexities in your business and do what you do well, really well, and be the best at it. There's, you can be a, the, the most successful company in the world if you're good, if you're the best one in the business at what you do. Um, so we don't, again, Marshall, I agree with you. I think we spend too much time attempting to do too much or be, be something that be everything to everybody. And it spreads us too thin and we can't put that deep thought and real planning into the things that really are of value to us. This has forced us to do that now. It's a, this is really a big blessing. It's a big blessing in all this. It's forced us to have those deep thinking sessions and critical thinking about our business and what's right and what's wrong with it. And we've got the time and we've got the need to do that kind of thing. So out of this, we will, you should be a much better company on the other side of this thing if you're using the time to do these kind of things. Yeah, when I, I'm seeing companies do more that, uh, about the things that were on their threats and opportunities list, you know, if they did a SWOT analysis, and you did if you were, have ever worked with a Petra coach before, right? And we sit there and preach to them and say, guys, we got to focus on these opportunities. We have to focus on these threats. And they have been able to fly through some of those and find solutions mm -hmm. within like two or three weeks, right? So they're able to move faster. Um, one of the, a good, a good example of a, a weakness that somebody has solved has been kind of what you were saying, uh, David, was they looked at the packages they offered clients. And as a weakness, they said, we have so many clients doing this one package and our profit margin keeps getting smaller and smaller because it keeps costing us more and more to deliver it. And what they've done is they, they've used this as an opportunity to eliminate the weakness of that low profit margin offering. And they're able to say, because of COVID, we're not offering this anymore. And we have a completely new package for you. And then that gives them the opportunity to increase that profit margin, to transition all those people very easily with a really good excuse over to a new, a new platform. Um, those are things that we can be looking at as business owners. It's, what would we change about our business that we, won't, we may not have been able to change before? What would we do differently going forward? So I'd like to share one example, and I'd like to leverage exactly what you just said, Jennifer, and we may be able to share, share some insight to help others. Um, you talk about the, the act of simplification. Uh, either one of you, have you ever, ever owned an American Honda, Honda car? Either one of you ever owned a Honda? Okay, Honda, let's take the Honda Accord. It comes in DX, LX, EX. And that's the three models. And it comes in a handful of colors and you can only get certain combinations of interior in those colors. It is a very tight, critical path about what you can or can I, you may be able to add navigation, you may be able to add leather seats, but it, it is very straight on that. And having had American Honda as a customer before, when you negotiate with their procurement office, the first time they said it, I said, you're going to say it again. I didn't hear that right. They said, we're going to sign this up today and we need the out years to get cheaper. And I said, excuse me? They said, yeah, we want your contract to get cheaper over time because we have to hold the value of our cars. And as much as I fought with them, you know, I loved a, a good bantering session, right? But as much as I fought with them, I totally understood how they're able to keep the values of their vehicles from escalating dramatically in price over the years. It's simplification. But Jennifer, I want to hit you with this and David as well. And that is, we talk about taking advantage of threats and opportunities. And we talk about the fact that people don't pay attention to cash and others. And you can walk us through tactically how teams should work together to go from ideas to execution and ingrain that in their meeting rhythms in a way that it doesn't get in the way of the critical path of the business, but yet gets the focus it needs to successfully get that stuff into the market. I mean, it's the Petra process, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's what we do every day with organizations and what we've been doing with organizations specifically around pivoting their business in the past, you know, how many weeks have we been doing this now? Are we on like week eight or something? <laughs> I, I want to go deeper though, Jennifer. I want to go deeper because the Petra process as it lends itself to doing that Oftentimes, businesses stay comfortable with execution, and when it comes to getting a little bit of that newer strategy, 
it's those bigger things you said you said they don't find the time to talk about it in monthly meetings like they should they don't dedicate the time to it is it a lack of focus or are they not dedicating the amount of time and sometimes possibly allocating resources to it or they're afraid to try new things be a combination of all of those things right i think what we see most of the time is um they aren't dedicating the time to it that they needed to dedicate to it ahead of like before this and when you talk you've talked about meeting rhythms so you you kind of uh dropped planted that little seed right to say what about meeting rhythms you know how do you have a dedicated meeting where you and the leadership of the organization are looking at your strategic plan and forgetting about all the crap that you know you get bogged down with every single day and coming in with some energy and going let's look up and out and not down and in and get in the weeds what can we how can we think big what scares the crap out of us that could absolutely change the business and usually we say you know do that on a monthly basis it's like a strategic planning for just the leadership and then on top of that you can you can get fantastic ideas from your frontline employees to help feed the ideas in that monthly meeting with your with you know upper level management I feel like I know I can tell Marshall wants to say something. Like, oh, <laughs> no, no. ready to jump in. No, no, no. I, I'm uh, uh, relishing. In, I'm relishing in hearing you guys. So no, I have nothing to say. David, what about you? Well, I, I think you hit on. You have got to be committed to excellence. Which, in order to be that, you've got to commit time to dreaming. Is what you have to do, and your team has to be a part of that. Kind of like this board. I, I like to set up just a a dream board of visions and have all possibilities considered and then just determine the best ones and then build out a plan to execute them on them. But most teams are quote too busy to spend time thinking strategically on a regular basis. So you know, one of the exercises we do at times is creating this vivid vision of your company. What's it going to look like 10 years or 25 years from now? And you will start working backwards. It's just like the planning day. Uh, but it's more it's more dream oriented than it is you know realistic, but that's where the fun comes in, guys, and that's where the fun of business is, is create that vivid vision of what you want to look like 25 years from now, and then begin to walk back from that, and determine what I need to do today ultimately to get me to that point, and consider all possibilities. There are no bad answers. If I was, it's fun to just. Let everybody dream and fill up a whole board, your whole wall with all the different dreams. And then you're better able to sort through the ones that make sense. And yeah. then try a few of them. And if they don't work, don't, don't invest too, you know, don't bet the farm on it, but try a few things. And if they don't work, failure's okay. Make sure failure is okay. And then do it again. But I think just being committed to dreaming, I think, is, a, is something many or not most, but many teams are afraid to do because they don't have time. And right. they, you don't have not you don't have time not to dream in my, is what I think. Yeah, and if you have done sort of any sort of visioning exercise, and and we work with with our CEO, our member leaders to build that vivid vision document. It's time to dust that thing off and go back to it and look at it and say, is this still true? Yeah. Is this this the path we still need to be going down? And if it is, what can we go do to execute on it right now? To to really take one big giant step forward. Um, and it may not seem so far away if, if you have the, the time, the resources, and the, and the newfound energy maybe uh, through this pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Marsha, what about you? Uh, I'm just sitting here, you know, by the way, first of all, I'm, I'm blessed to get to share this with the two of you because even in this craziness with serving members, uh, I don't see you two enough. So I'm incredibly blessed to be here today but I also want to share that um, this gives us time to reflect on what we're seeing that members are doing really well and also what we have to be uh, more bullish on in working with them and I will tell you that for those leaders that I and we have worked with that have put together oftentimes five years a good you know I've had a 15 year vivid vision a five year and in some cases a very fast moving a three year and when you first think about it, creating a vivid vision, in other words, dropping a point in time and writing a story as if you were standing there that day at that point in time, looking backwards in the business, when that gets done, I am blown away, no matter how far-fetched some of the vision seems 
about how close companies get to achieving those visions. And what it reminds me of as leaders, we have two ways to communicate with our teams and the public by informing or influencing. And the act of having a vision in a way that we repeat over and over that allows someone to see where they plug in to how they can help the company complete that vision inspires and influences people in a way that they want to be a part of that something significant. And I think coming out of this for sure, I will make sure that for, if, for the members I do not work with yet on Vivid Vision, that I will push them into the exercise of doing it because it's extremely uncomfortable to do. And what you do if you get a bunch of high C uh, disc profiles in a room, not that I know of any, yeah. you get a bunch of high C disc profiles in a room, as soon as you put the Vivid Vision up there, I saw a room of engineers immediately go to attempting to figure out how to get the answers filled in for the next 15 years. And you have to remove all that mindset and allow your mind to wander and then start filling in the gaps under the old saying that will grossly overestimate what we can get done in one year, grossly underestimate what we can get done three to five or 10 years. So as you talk through that, I was able to listen and take away some things that I know I can do better as a leader and a coach to help others. You, one thing that you, the Vivid Vision also does, Marshall and Jennifer, in, that I've seen, uh, it, it's a point of comfort, guys. If you know where you're ultimately going to be, this is just a blip. This isn't the end all. But if you've got no future vision, it might feel like that. So it gets you through these obstacles because you know long term, it's not it, you, where you're going. So it's a, it can be a point of focus and comfort, and especially in a time like this, as a business owner, knowing, you know, I know it's, I know it's hell. It's going to be another year. But, you know, 25 years from now, we're going to be here. And you keep your eye on that versus the immediate. So I, I, I've, heard, I've heard some members talk about that. You know, this is just a blip. We'll get through it because we know where we're going. So I give you, it's like, there's a level of comfort in knowing that. I want to shift a little bit um, because I think um, I want to utilize both David and Marshall's knowledge from a financial standpoint and, and, and ask David the question of, you know, you, and I'll set, you, set it up here for you. you. You have been ahead of even some bankers on what's coming down the pipe with this stimulus package. What has changed this week? What new information has come out like within the past, you know, three to five days that you think would be helpful for people to know? Yeah, there's some, some good things and a couple of, first of all, there, unfortunately, rules are being written as we go on a lot of this stuff. So what you may have read initially, I don't know if it's change is the right word, it's being altered and um, it, it, may, it may detrimentally impact you if you don't stay on top of these things. One, one thing we did, learned or got confirmation from the IRS this week is the uh, in regard to the PPP funds for the funds that you expend on the allowable expenses that ultimately get forgiven for you you cannot also deduct those expenses on your tax return that was not clear in fact there was some talk when the act came out that it's kind of you're gonna get the benefit of both you're gonna get it get your expenses paid for and forgiven you're also going to be able to deduct this. Well, the IRS issued a ruling this week saying, uh-uh, we're not going to let you do that. Now, there is some talk in Congress right now saying, no, that's not what we meant to do. We're doing everything we can to help. So they may reverse that. But as of now, there's an official ruling from the IRS that says, no, if you get your expense, these expenses forgiven with our free money, you cannot also deduct those. So there is an impact on you just to be thinking about and be aware of that. A couple of good things came out this week. I keep talking about this Main Street lending and the bankers aren't even ready to make these loans yet, but the Federal Reserve's allocated $600 billion in loans to help companies meet liquidity in the future. And they built it in a way that if you take these loans, your bankers and you have to agree, you're not gonna pay off any existing lines or things that you've got because this is an additional liquidity measure. It's not a refinancing measure. So they've created three different ways to get three different types of these loans. And I think every small business should look at these things as a future source of liquidity. And they're gonna be uh, pushing these out through the banking system. So you'll work with your banker. So what I advise, call your banker, say, hey, here this Main Street lending's coming out. As soon as you get word on how it's gonna work, I wanna talk to you about it. And they're 
Now, I will tell you, some of the bankers say, what are you talking about? You know, so it's just they, there's not enough information out there. So that's a good thing. A liquidity measure that the Fed, Federal Reserve is going to be pushing through the banking system. We should all look at. Um, and I think we're getting a little more uh, clearer on how to track and forgiveness. I mean, I think we've, we really didn't think we, were, we rushed to get the money. Now we're saying, oh, shoot, what do we do now? We're gonna, now we got the money. Uh, well, again, we've, we've kind of dug into that. We saw that, you know, ahead of the curve, hopefully, that uh, that's going to be the next issue. So we've kind of built a process and a learning that, that you guys are all open to get, you know, take advantage of that logically tells you what best practices would be to track your expenses so that you get you can maximize your forgiveness. And so it's very important now that you're on the other side, you got the money, the eight, the eight weeks is, are running. Now's the time to think about that, not six weeks from now. Um, so we're getting a little more clarification on how to do that and what's expected and that kind of thing. Um, so things are getting clearer. Some things are changing on us. And I think there's some new programs coming down the pike to help further help us through this process. Yeah, David, you shared a really awesome uh, spreadsheet this morning about how to track your forgiveness, uh, like to track that that's money so you can get the maximum forgiven. Yeah. Yeah. And today on our workshop that I um, snuck into and listened in on, and it was it was an incredibly valuable tool. Um, so yeah, if you if that's something that sounds familiar or sounds like something you would want to use or need, reach out to us. Let us know. We can get you that Excel spreadsheet. You know I love Excel spreadsheets, Marshall. I'm, I'm the high C in the room. I, I know you were talking about me, so yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll hold it against you. One thing about it, right? if you have got eight weeks to utilize these funds, so if you've got your money now, the clock is running. You yeah. cannot wait for three weeks to say, oh, what am I going to do with this? Uh, and how am I going to spend it? And how first, and mainly, how am I going to track this so I can get forgiveness? So this is something you cannot sit on if you've got your funds uh, you've got to begin to manage that process immediately or you run the risk of not getting as much as you could forgiven if you don't do it properly. Yeah, I may add just a couple things to that, Jennifer, did, uh, just based on the laws of conservatism, some of the things I've been sharing. And that is, um, <laughs> look, uh, there's forgiveness loans and people want to be forgiven. Fair enough, right? Mm -hmm. But I get asked some really crazy questions sometimes with people's desire to use all the money and get forgiveness, right? There's an old saying that says, something feels too good to be true, it usually is, and where I'm going with this is the following. I always go back when I feel lost in an answer and say, what was the original intent? I'm gonna give you a real live example. The original intent was to keep your workforce employed yep. versus letting them go and run the risk of losing or unemployment and all that other stuff. And so I get asked a question by just insert random company here and it says, well, we've got salespeople and we normally pay commissions a certain way. And what we're thinking about was maybe we go back instead of paying commissions upon delivery, we accelerate and change our commissions policy and front load it so we can make sure we use the money. Now, I don't know the exact answer, but the guidance I gave in a situation like that is if you go moving down the path of people start earning more money or you start changing policies and procedures that were in place in an effort that it looks like you're gaming the system, you may send off the audit flags. I just push back gently whether it's the right answer or not, so don't take this in the audience as the right answer. I said it seems to me like the intent was to keep those people whole. There may be a possibility you could do a non-recoverable draw against future commissions not to exceed the amount of money that they made last year that, quote, keeps them whole. Therefore, you haven't changed anything. You kept them employed, you kept them paid what they paid last year, and you met the requirements of the plan. I don't know if that's the right answer or not, but it, if you go start changing a bunch of things in an effort to look like you're wanting to get the most out of the system, it may come back and you have some explaining to do. The other piece is I would say, stay up to date in your reading. So for an example, I had a question that came up from someone around independent contractors or self-employed. Mm -hmm. And those monies are limited just like an employee to $100,000 annual max. If you go read the interim rule that came out late in April, it specifically says that those independent contractors or self-employed will be limited to a certain amount of money that can be used for compensation replacement, mm -hmm. which means if you don't have rent and you don't have mortgage and you don't have lease expenses 
There's a certain amount that you don't get to use at all for compensation, replacement, no matter what you do. Now that may change again. So my advice to whoever's listening is, make sure you continue to stay up to date and print off all those articles and stick them in a file somewhere and have all the coverage you can have about what you need to stay in compliance. I don't know if you have heard the same thing or following the same things, but um, felt a little odd, but it is what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they seem to have made the, first of all, they didn't focus on the sole proprietor till the last minute. And actually their guidance didn't come out till a week after when they promised to have it out. So I, you know, I don't know how much thought was put into this, but they made it very prescriptive for what you can borrow and what you can be forgiven for. So it's not, it's, it's as clear as, as anything. I'm not, I don't know, I don't know if I necessarily agree it's fair, totally, because it's all based on really 2019 versus really what's going on today or before the, the in 2020 could have been, a, you know, could be a different situation pre-COVID. So, but anyway, it is what it is. So it's based on 2019 to give you some formulas on what to use and how to calculate your loan and your forgiveness. So. Right now, it's pretty fairly easy to do that, to calculate that. Not a lot of wiggle room. Um, but it is what it is it's for that, so. Clear as mud, David. Um, on, what's that? That it's clear what's as that? mud. Well, yeah, and, and, and I can almost promise you 100% the rules are gonna change before we get to the very end of this thing anyway, because they, they just, they just, they've been changing about every day, it seems like, so. Yeah, and I think that's what's so frustrating for people, right, is we just want to make, we want black and white answers. We want to know, like, what are, what is, at least for people like me, I know Marshall's <laughs> laughing at me, like, the right way, what is the wrong way? And we are such in this gray area right now that, you know, to reiterate what David's saying is, and what Marshall's saying, do the best you can with integrity and document everything. Yeah. And, 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 build your case of why you made the decisions that you made so that, you know, and you have all, all of your documentation, all of the, the transactions uh, in place so that if there is a question, you're ready for that. And, and it's going to be hard for them to come back and say, well, we, we, we told you not to do it because they haven't really, yeah. it's so gray. It's yeah. kind of like the Nashville weather. If you don't like it, it'll change. Yeah. <laughs> What, what the mindset you should have, and hopefully this isn't the case, is that you may be subject to an IRS type audit. Highly unlikely, but if you have that mindset, that'll, that'll guide some of your decision making and documentation um, support that you're going to gather and be ready for. Again, will that happen? I don't know. There's you know several millions of loans that are going to be made. I don't know how you could, every, everybody could be audited that way, but you do run the risk of and audit and at whatever level the bankers or the SBA requires, you're going to have to comply with if you want forgiveness. So think, if you think that way, that might guide your thinking going forward and how you're going to manage this process. Yeah. All right. Any, any final words as we come to, come to the close? This is your chance, Marshall. Hey, uh, Marshall. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm often lost for words. Um, and now my, I, I shared this with an earlier group today and, you know, my late father said that things always work themselves out and they typically work out better than you ever expected. However, it drives us crazy when we're not in control. And over the last eight weeks have been many times in which some really strong people in our lives love to be in control. And the fact is they just weren't in control. And we have to be at peace that if we plan and do the best we can, that things will work out for the good. And so, and I can't think of one time that it hasn't. So uh, that's my closing words, and I thank both of you for allowing me to share this time with you today. Yeah, it was fun, Marshall. Um, I would, you know, closing thought is something we've been saying a lot around the Petra, Petra universe lately is change is inevitable, growth is optional. You know, things were going to change whether COVID happened or not. This just highlights the whole situation, right, that change is going to happen whether we like it or not. What we can do is focus on the growth. How can we get better? How can we change our business for the better? How can we change our, our clients' lives for the better? And, and the impact in general just that we have on the world. Um, we have to look at this as an opportunity for growth, even though it's the struggle, you know, the struggle's real right now, right? We can capitalize on that and have a positive 
outlook on it. Yeah. David, take us home. Yeah, my, my final statement is if you don't come out on the other side a better company and a better person, shame on you. Because you've got the time and you've got the motivation to do that. So there's no excuses to not be better on the other side of this thing. And then we can all outperform if we do that. Um, again, thank you, thank you, Marshall and Jennifer, for being here and, and uh, making this a meaningful uh, hour with our Coach's Corner. I do want to make sure that everybody that's, that's on here uh, is aware. We've got a ton of resources on the PetraCoach.com website. There's a COVID-19 tab on there. Uh, if you'll go to that, we've got man, just unlimited, probably some of the best resources out there in dealing with, you know, company issues and planning and health and everything else on it. We've got a host of webinars that we've conducted that are recorded. I'd advise you to you know, watch some of those uh, across all subjects. And we have a lot of new workshops and webinars coming. One's uh, about, we call our pivot or DSRO, DSRO, you know, going from defense to offense and working through those stages. And I think Jennifer did one of those yesterday and we had 50 something people on, I believe. So it's, it's a hot topic right now. Uh, so take advantage of that. Learn how to get to the other side. We believe it's now time to be moving toward offense. We've been in defense long enough. It's time to move toward offense. And this workshop will help get you started that way. Uh, two, two or three of the coaches, one of my, myself included, we do some on the government assistance. Uh, we're tempted to stay on top of that thing and bring some of the, the, the most current information. And we do those about every week or so, or every couple of weeks. It's, uh, if you'll look at the website, you'll see those too. Um, love to have you in on that. Um, and we're coming up with some other new, new things that are they're kind of flipping the switch, moving us toward to getting back to normal. And those will be available on our website too. Please, please take advantage of it. We're, we're not here to sell you anything. We're only here to make you a better person and a better company. And if we think if we do that, then we'll all, we'll all benefit from it. So, and we're all available. You can get any of the coaches uh, on emails or phone calls, and uh, we're glad to help in any way we can. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're going to have future Coaches Corners. Hope you'll be on those um, in addition to many other things. So check our website, petrocoach.com, and uh, stay healthy and uh, go do something good. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Dave.